So welcome everyone again to the special session on crafting comments. Um, this is about the nature of crafting comments in, in responding to advance notice of proposed rulemakings, uh, rulemakings, order, institute, order instituting rulemakings, all the things that agencies do to get public opinion. Um, but specifically we're hosting this due to the Federal Trade Commission um, and PRM advance notice of proposed rulemaking on commercial surveillance and data security. So so I'm going to be talking about in this presentation, I'm not just going to be uh, giving like an extremely detailed analysis, um, a little bit of a detailed analysis on the FTC and PRM. But with that analysis, I'm more so going to be talking about the nature of actually writing comments and also go into why this is important and why with this specific call, we are highlighting this because it is due to communication that we've had with folks um, at the FTC who told us that they really do want people to be involved and to get as many comments as possible. And so with that, oh, and again, for people who's joined, I said this a bit in the beginning, but more people joined in. I'm Serena Oduro, I'm the policy analyst at Data and Society. Um, Data and Society, we have submitted quite a few comments um, related to the AI. Uh, we did part, uh, comments in partnership with AI Now on the NAIR Research Task Force. Um, and I've also submitted comments at my time at the Greenlining Institute. Uh, the Greenlining Institute is a policy advocacy institute based in Oakland, focused on creating economic opportunity for communities of color. And I helped them uh, cra uh, craft comments in respondents to a few uh, a few different proceedings at the California Public Utilities Commission, and then also in response to the Department of Labor. So I feel very comfortable with submitting comments at this point, which is why I thought it would be great to uh, bring that experience here in case there are folks who don't have that experience and want to be involved in the FTC call, but maybe just don't know how. And honestly, it's not too scientific or too difficult, but I thought I could just demystify it a bit, and hopefully that'll actually make it easier for you to submit comments instead of making it harder. That's definitely the goal for today. So what is at stake? I thought I'd just talk about this a bit because it will frame, again, why we're very passionate about this specific call. Um, so of course, uh, most of us who are probably on this call work in the field of algorithmic accountability policy or in algorithmic accountability when it comes to writing, engineering, et cetera, somehow around that sphere. Um, and in the US since 2016, there has been some uh, legislation like the Algorithmic Accountability Act of 2016, the updated 2019, 2020 version, um, a lot of movement on the state levels with uh, bans against facial recognition technology, um, the California Privacy Protection Agency, um, which uh, has kind of the strongest uh, data privacy standards thus far in the country on the state and federal level. Um, and that was instituted a year or so ago. Um, and then we also have, you know, currently this year, again, there's the Algorithm Accountability Act, though chances of passing, I'm not sure. And then there's also the American Data Privacy and Protection Act that has gained some ground. But again, when it comes to legislation in the US, chances of passing, we're not sure. That one's gotten a lot more action than many other regulations or, or legislation, but it's still an unknown. Um, on the global level, I mean, there's a lot going on. I can't speak to the whole world, of course, because there's a lot going on in, in, on all continents. But, you know, in the European Union, we have the General Data Protection Regulations, the EU AI Act, uh, the Digital Services Act, the Digital Markets Act. They've had a lot more movement of actually like, passing bills related to data privacy um, and also algorithmic accountability. Whether people agree with what they've, you know, proposed, I think it's a very complex conversation, but movement has been made. Um, on the uh, U.S. level, of course, that hasn't happened uh, with the le legislation, especially on the federal level. And so seeing this FTC call um, on commercial surveillance and data security, it's definitely an opportunity uh, for the FTC, which, you know, they're in charge of antitrust and also particularly looking at unfair and deceptive commercial practices, they have an opportunity, especially having a more willing, um, you know, Lena Khan and other folks at the FTC who are very willing to regulate or desire to regulate, of course, whether they can uh, with, you know, oppos opposing parties, et cetera, is, is difficult, but they do want to engage in al creating algorithmic accountability legislation. And so we see this as a very important opportunity with comments to, uh, support their efforts and say that this should happen. And of course, this is an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking. So rulemaking hasn't uh, started yet. They're just putting out 
should we do this? Is there, is there ground? Is there actually a lot of unfair and deceptive practices that means that we should go after, you know, creating uh, market-wide rules instead of case-by-case -case adjudication? I mean, we believe yes, a lot of other folks believe yes. And so right now what they're looking for specifically is a lot of support of people saying that there are widespread unfair and deceptive practices when it comes to commercial surveillance and data security, and we need you know, we need to go forth in creating uh, regulations that the FTC can enforce. Um, obviously, even if they were, if even if they proceed further, those regulations would take a while. It's not a guarantee that we'd have, you know, any um, grand framework by next year. But it is a start, and you know, being in policy, it does have me excited. So that's why we're ho hosting the session today. It's hopefully encourage folks. I'm guessing all of y'all are interested in some capacity of submitting comments. And so that's kind of the groundwork for what's at stake um, with this particular call. But I also hope that this is an opportunity if y'all haven't submitted comments before to pay attention to what's going on at the federal and state agency level because submitting comments is actually, to me, a really great opportunity to be involved in a regulation. Uh, I think a lot of people pay uh, attention to legislation, but the regulatory side, there's also a lot of opportunity uh, for action. So this is just another avenue for research to become um, influential in the policy process. So this is just, uh, you know, grabbing some headlines, again, highlighting that, you know, the FTC, especially this FTC under the leadership of Lena Khan and other, you know, amazing folks have been uh, doing a case by case adjudication against companies like Facebook, Kochava, etc. Particularly when it comes to like deceptive practices, it seems like particularly when um, companies maybe aren't upholding their own like terms and conditions, etc. Um, and so they have done the case by case, but of course, uh, algorithmic discrimination, uh, unfair and deceptive practices when it comes to surveillance, and then also the uses of people's data is pretty rampant. And so that's again why they're um, pursuing a market-wide rule instead of just doing a case-by-case -case adjudication. Um, and then up top, I put about the kids' social media bill, and that's more just to show that there is movement right now and, and folks caring about, um, especially since the Francis Hogan uh, thing and, and different stuff, um, but I think since 2016, an interest in legislation um, around protecting people online. And right now, this year, there has been a lot of movement as well. So I also think it's a very good time to use research to be involved in this political process because there has been more movement this year than I've even seen in the past two, personally working in the field. So thus far in the FTC, again, the advanced notice of proposed rate rulemaking, there have been two opportunities to be involved. The first was the September 8th public forum. And that was an opportunity for the FTC. They had Alina Khan, I believe Alvaro, uh, uh, Chairman Alvaro Bedoya, and a few folks um, give presentations and speak about this call and what they desire from it. Um, and then also, it was an opportunity for uh, honestly anyone, which is again, it's something I will highlight when it comes to comments. It's an opportunity for anyone to be involved, um, but an opportunity for civil society folks, people who've been personally harmed um, to, and also industry, I mean, whoever's interested to do like a two minute kind of speech or presentation about whether they support this advanced notice of proposed rulemaking or not, how they think people should go about um, this or how the FTC should go about this rulemaking, et cetera. Um, our executive director, Janet Haven, got to talk, which was great. And it's a great opportunity. I mean, and it passed already, but just highlighting, if you were able to go, that's great. If not, just in the future for other um, rulemakings, you know, public forums are a great opportunity to A, see who else is speaking and which kind of dominant approaches, ideologies, uh, uh, policies are really dominating what people are talking about. And then also to just be involved yourself and say, you know, we should pay attention to this. Um, and, you know, people at agencies do pay attention to what you say and other people who are watching pay attention to what's being said. So it's a great opportunity to get involved. Um, and then the second is submitting comments. Um, so the deadline, and I'll show in this next slide, it's October 21st. Um, after a call is released, you normally have 
30 to 60 days, sometimes I think 90, but not always, but normally 30 to 60 days to submit comments. And so this is kind of the last piece of being able to get really involved and say your opinion um, due to this call about whether they should pursue a rulemaking on commercial surveillance and data security. So again, basic information, it's due, the comments are due October 21st, and I'm going to talk about later how to actually submit comments in, in case you all don't know. It's pretty easy and you can find the information luckily very easily online. Um, but the due date's October 21st. I'd like to get data and societies submitted like a few days beforehand. I don't like waiting to the deadline, but you do have till that deadline. Um, and also, uh, with, specifically with this call, they uh, and they said this actually in the public forum, which again is why it's great to attend those events and actually is recorded. You could look up FTC commercial surveillance and data security and you should be able to find the recording of the public forum if you'd like to watch it. You don't have to watch like everyone's little speeches, but you could watch uh, the first two speakers in the panels. That, that could be useful. Um, but something that the speakers from the FTC said was that they really encourage individual comments. And they also really want a, a lot of comments. Um, not all agencies say that, but I, do, I, I imagine just due to the political climate and the importance of uh, this NPRM, but also knowing that a lot of folks don't want them to probably pursue it. They just want a lot of people to show up and say that we want you to, to pursue this rulemaking. And here, you know, here's the opinions of particularly where you should focus. Um, so you can, like the an example that I'm gonna share later is uh, Data and Society and AI Now uh, did um, joint uh, comments, you can do joint comments with, with different organizations or with multiple people and then just kind of sign it. You know, all of these people did it together. That's great. But with this one specifically, they said they want individual comments, um, which I think speaks to just, again, the breadth of people that they want to have and have people really show up and show out and say, like, this really matters, um, particularly because you know that you know, if there's industry folks who are against it, they're probably going to show out and also say that they don't want it. So I think they really want that counterweight, which is also, again, why we're hosting this today, because they also said they want, you know, academics who have research relevant to this to, to, you know, write a comment and, you know, say your opinion of whether you support it or not, to provide evidence, to provide your research. Um, I also want to highlight that uh, individual stories are useful as well. So it doesn't have to just be that, you're a researcher, like citizens who have personal experiences with harms or ideas are also very encouraged to submit as well. So it doesn't have to be just you're a researcher. You could just be someone affected by uh, the issue and those stories are also highly valuable. Um, and storytelling in general is highly valuable and I'll get to that a bit more later. But that's why we you know, wanna highlight submitting individual comments. Um, and then I'll go into what the format of those can look like. Try to demystify it. Again, it's not too scary. It doesn't have to be too specific, but just letting you know a bit of the ins and outs of writing comments. So some useful documents and links that I wanted to share. Um, first is federalregister.gov and regulations.gov. Uh, federalregister.gov, I believe, and you have to look online because both of the names are so similar, but those register.gov is where you will submit your comments. And on both of them, you can um, find, you can literally, they both have search bars. You can search FTC um, commercial surveillance and data security, and the call will pop up. Um, the cool thing is you can also, they, what will also pop up is all the other comments that have been submitted thus far. I looked yesterday and I think over a hundred are submitted thus far and it looks like mostly by individuals, um, but you can read other people's comments. And if you do that, you could do that right now if you wanted to and look, if you scroll on individuals uh, comments and it shows, all of them are like a paragraph, you know, saying like, we support this, so you should look at this research, et cetera. Um, I think those comments are useful. I, I, I'm gonna show how you can write in a teeny bit of a more robust way that I think may be more helpful, but it does show that you you really can say anything. We also have to know that it's public and it's permanent. So all comments that are submitted, you can find on a record. And that's true for all agencies. So I submitted comments to the Department of Labor, yesterday I googled like Green Lining Institute because that's where I was at the time Department of Labor comments and I was able to find them. Um, so Google is also pretty friendly for being able to find those uh, list of comments that are submitted. I um, mean it's federalregister.gov where you can look at the full call and then also submit comments. Also regulations.gov you can also find um, the list of calls and I find that that site just looks a little prettier to me. It's a bit easier to use. So 
feel free if you're doing research to use regulations.gov as well. Um, also, of course, you know, looking at the advance notice of proposed rulemaking or I kind of call it the call, um, you know, the document, uh, the website document at federalregister.gov or regulations.gov. Um, they also, the FTC on their website, they have it as well. Um, of course, reading through the whole call is useful. Of course, this one has over 90 questions, so it's a lot, but you can look at, that's very important to look at to know which questions you'd like to respond to. Um, but I also wanted to highlight looking at the press release and fact sheets can actually be really helpful. And something I wanted to highlight, um, because this FTC call is on commercial surveillance and data security, and I've been in a lot of meetings with different folks from different organizations and also talking you know, to researchers at Data and Society who are experts on these issues and issues related to, you know, to uh, what they're asking for in the call. And the definition of commercial surveillance in the ANPRM is a bit confusing. So just reading it aloud, I, I jotted it here. Um, when it comes to the call and the definition that they put of commercial surveillance, it says it refers to the collection, aggregation, analysis, retention, transfer, or monetization of consumer data and the direct derivatives of that information. These data include both information that consumers actively provide, say when they affirmatively register for a service or make a purchase, as well as personal identifiers and other information that companies collect. For example, when a consumer casually browses the web or opens an app, this latter category is far broader than the first. Um, and I, I jotted down that definition, but I have to admit after I was still a bit confused with what that really means, because when they're saying commercial surveillance, I think, again, just thinking about surveillance and thinking almost facial recognition technology, watching people, um, et cetera. <laughs> like, and I think all of us were a bit confused of what are the bounds of this definition. I also want to highlight in comments, you can question the definition. You can question the bounds of of the call and say you need to broaden it or this definition needs to be changed etc so if you feel confused you can question it but i also want to highlight that in the fact sheet that I actually found on the ftc's press release um, they had another definition of commercial surveillance in the fact sheet and fact sheets are one or two pages quick overviews um, that's very policy uh, that's very popular in the policy space and i like them because since they're so condensed they have to be very clear and so then in that uh, document, it said, commercial surveillance is the business of collecting, analyzing, and profiting from information about people. Technologies essential to everyday life also enable near constant surveillance of people's private lives. The volume of data collected exposes people to identity thieves and hackers. Mass surveillance has heightened the risks and stakes of errors, deception, manipulation, and other abuses. The Federal Trade Commission is asking the public to weigh in on whether new rules are needed to protect people's privacy and information in the commercial surveillance economy. Um, and I found that very interesting because I was like, okay, if you're talking about the rise of the access to data that companies have, being able to collect it, aggregate it, uh, analyze it, profit from it, and then the way that, that manifests in either data security harms or people being watched or being subjected to unfair ad practices, et cetera, then what they're talking about, again, in that second definition is the business that, uh, honestly, that big data has provided to folks and led to this kind of economy of surveillance through the access to that data, which I guess, at least in my mind, helps me frame this way differently than that first definition ever did. And so that's the importance of looking at those different documents because that just made it click for me in a different way. And we could talk about that further later, but that's why I just wanted to highlight the different types of documents you can look at. And fact sheets I think are very important to maybe provide a clarity that they didn't feel like they had to, and they probably didn't purposely do it, but the AMPRM is like 40 pages, so they're not limited by length. So maybe not forced to be as clear as a one or two page fact sheet forces them to be. And then also, uh, particularly with this call, you can look at statements. Uh, you can find at federalregister.gov, I believe I saw on the ANPRM call at the bottom, they had the statements from the, I believe, four different commissioners at the FCC and their perspective on it, uh, on the call. Um, two, I believe, didn't agree with the, um, with the uh, ANPRM and thought that uh, Chair Lena Khan and other folks were stepping outside of their purview. <laughs> um, so, I think that's just interesting to look at what are the different arguments that 
this call is having to deal with that we have to fight against. And maybe that's something that you could respond to in your comment, but you definitely don't have to, but it is interesting to get a gauge of like the political atmosphere at the moment. And so with all of the talking about all of this, I wanted to talk about what are comments um, and comments are one, anyone can submit them. Doesn't have to be an academic or politician, et cetera. Anyone can. Um, and they can really can look like anything. Um, they can be, I mean, you can literally just submit, yes, I agree with this call. <laughs> or you could have like a 10 to 20 page document. I think the 10 page documents seem a bit more useful than just saying yes, but you, you could just do that in theory. There really isn't any strict rules of what it has to be, but there are approaches that are more effective than others. Um, and again, comments are written documents that you submit to them and you can find them. They are public um, on any website uh, or not any website, but on the department's website. So if you looked up DNS and AI now, NAIR comment, you could find that actually not at federal register of, but at AI of because it was that agency that put out the call. Um, so you also just want to know that if you don't want to put anything that you wouldn't want to be public, because when it, once it is published, pretty impossible to get it unpublished. So only include information that you're completely comfortable with being public. And then, so why are comments important? Um, I just distilled it down to three things, um, which is representation. I think representation um, also, you know, in my experience with submitting at the CPUC, the California Public Utilities Commission um, and other uh, comment, comments at agencies, looking at them, you can always see that industry is always going to show up <laughs> to kind of give their opinion. Um, and you do want other folks who maybe more represent like civil society, um, you know, historically marginalized communities, et cetera, to also say their opinion because comments act as a collection of what the public thinks. And the public could say, you want to pursue that rulemaking? We don't think you should. Um, and if enough people say that, that could actually stop them from pursuing a rulemaking. It could also push them to, you know, do a rulemaking if enough people respond. So it's very important to, be involved to make sure that the public's opinion is you know presented um and again as an individual you can submit as well um so at the california public utilities commission a lot of our work was on broadband access and greenlining at, at the time and still is was a major voice about um broadband access and the digital divide particularly for like black and brown communities in the city um typically that issue is phrased framed as uh, the digital divide is an issue of, you know, people in rural areas not having access, but everyone in the city, they're fine, they're good. And a lot of our research was actually, that's not true. And I'll, I'll actually show a map about that later. Um, but our voice was very important to include um, whenever there was a uh, California Public Utility Commission's order instituting rulemakings on broadband access or expanding lifeline and different programs, because, you know, we knew we were one of the main voices who would say, you should look at this <laughs> uh, and you have to think about it this way. So it was a major way to have influence. Um, also documentation, uh, they are public and can be found online. Uh, since this is a room of researchers, I would also like to add that I do think that uh, looking at past uh, full list of who's part, who submitted and what they submitted can really show you like the different ideologies, responses, policies that are really controlling uh, a conversation. And I'm going to be talking about that a bit later, but there was one, um, there was one order instituting rulemaking at the CPUC about prison phone call rates. And the proceeding had already started, but we were considering getting involved and in, uh, supporting other organizations doing work on that. And I read all the submissions that have been done and it gave me a good idea of, okay, who are the industry players? What are the arguments that they're giving to justify such high rates? And then what, what is the leading research that um, nonprofit institutes, civil society organizations are using in response to this? Um, so it's a great way, like, we, I mean, I'm kind of a policy nerd, but to me, it's a very interesting to read through all of them actually, to get a taste of the dominating arguments controlling um, the conversation. And that will also very much control 
what the regulation will be or the limits of the possibility of what that regulation can be. If no one's advocating for black communities, you're probably not gonna have regulation that advocates or is like responsive to the needs of, the, of black, black communities, for example. So it's important to know like who, who's being involved and, and who's being included. Again, kind of with that representation piece. And then also included with that is recommendations. Um, by being involved in comments, you can also influence the type of you know, policy approaches that they pursue that rulemaking that they highlight. Um, so again, include like with the broadband thing being like, you have to include uh, historically marginalized communities in the cities who you think have access but don't. Uh, you need to think about them when you create your lifeline programs, et cetera. It's an opportunity to influence the policy outcomes of those regulations, which is very important. And so I think it is an excellent, I think comments are an excellent opportunity to really pair research with, I don't wanna say activism, but but with results of there cannot be actual results that come from bringing your research to the forefront of a conversation uh, through engaging in comments. Um, and then I included this dot, 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 because, uh, um, you know, I've submitted comments to oppose um, an agency's goals, like during the Trump administration with the Department of Labor. And that's important. I think it was just important to us to like, have a counterweight saying y'all shouldn't do that, even if we knew that they probably wouldn't listen to us. Um, but it's particularly rewarding to be involved in comment making when you do know you probably have alignment or possibilities with that agency. So again, with the CPUC, the commissioner at the time, I, she might still be the commissioner, I'm not sure. I believe it was Commissioner Martha Guzman Aceves. Like she was just very uh, empathetic to, and I think had a very much desire to expand broadband access and with the prison phone call rates to reduce them, et cetera. So it makes it even more worth it to be involved when you know that the agency is led by people who care about your cause. And so they're supporting you, but you also have to support them by giving the evidence that they need to pursue the type of regulations that they'd want. So that really is that type of partnership. And I think that really is true with this FTC call right now. Uh, it, it's clear to me from the public forum um, and from other news about what the FTC has been doing with trying to regulate big tech and other tech companies that they definitely want to pursue this. They just need the su literal support of comments to further do it because if there's not enough support, even if they want to, they, they can only go so far um, and they can only push how far those regulations go if no one gives, the rec uh, gives recommendations that um, really expand upon what accountability would look like, which regulations they should pursue, which, which other state, federal, international regulations should they mirror. They need that type of information from folks to kind of lay the groundwork for how far they can push. And so here I wanted to talk about the importance of research. Again, I mentioned with the CPUC, um, there was a order instituting rulemaking on prison phone call rates. Um, and I hadn't been involved in that issue as much, greenlining, that's not like our focus area, but we're, we were involved so much in telecommunication services that we were just in community with a lot of those other organizations. And so uh, we knew this was going on. Um, and so I read a lot of the calls and it was very clear that this report, who pays the true cost of incarceration on families was very influential in that rulemaking. And honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if that report led to the rulemaking. I don't know that, but I wouldn't be surprised. Um, so what that research showed, and honestly, it was, it was really sad and infuriating, but it just showed that especially in California, people could be charged up to five to like $10 per, I don't know if it was per minute, but around that for a call uh, to folks within prisons who are incarcerated. Um, and just the devastation that that created and isolation that that created for those who were in prisons and those outside as well, uh, and their family members. Um, and also just showed how incarceration is uh, really just persecuting and preying on the poor and keeping people poor. Um, and so it was, a, it was an excellent, um, report from the Ella Baker Center. Um, and that was cited, again, reading all the comments by them and a lot of other folks uh, who had submitted comments. Um, and then actually, uh, the, uh, I looked back in, uh, at that rulemaking to see what had resulted and they had uh, instituted a, a cap of 0 0.07 cents per minute um, for calls and, and a lot of other details that I, I, I didn't look exactly into, but that's a major difference from the 
like I said, five, three to five to $10 per minute that they could charge. That was just absolutely ridiculous because there are no uh, regulations. Um, and so to me, that was, I mean, that harm was so egregious. It's sad that that even happens, but I am glad that that comment period and uh, researchers from policy advocacy institutes, you know, coming together uh, to submit comments and to really pay attention to this uh, order instituting rulemaking actually led to like very tangible change. Um, again, shouldn't have ever been an issue, but you know, we're fighting for what we fight for. Um, and so to me, that was a great, just a great way of seeing how when you're really like, when you have the, the research there, how it can really be used to make change. And, and I also think the research was so strong that there wasn't anything that industry could really say to be like, no, we should charge people that much for calls. It was just like, you can't make the argument. It's not a good one. Um, and so that was an important example of research. And then uh, this is the importance of research and personal narrative. So I wanted to put one other thing at Greenlining, we did this uh, heat map uh, comparing broadband service quality to historic uh, redlining. And as you can see, it mirrors very well um, with the history of redlining and also who does not have broadband access. And this was a very important map that we will cite also in proceedings because it showed that this is not an issue just related to folks who live in rural areas. Um, this is an issue within cities as well because of historical disenfranchisement manifesting in other ways. Um, and with that, the personal narratives piece, I actually couldn't find it, unfortunately, but Greenlining had a great blog post that they did a lot of interviews and also some fellows who had actually literally experienced lack of, of broadband access in Oakland. Uh, they created a whole report with all those personal narratives inter interwoven. And in our comments, we would also, with the permission of folks, I mean, some of the folks who experienced it were the ones literally writing it, but with their permission, with their leadership, interwove their stories into the comments. And that's very powerful as well. Uh, narrative and personal stories is really powerful within comment writing. So I would highlight that, you know, if you've been personally affected or know other people are personally affected, that's just as valuable as research um, and policy. So I just wanna highlight that because it's not just about academic writing. So that's also useful. And so with that, knowing, you know, uh, Data and Society is a research institute. So, so uh, we do more academic style writing. I just wanna talk about the difference between policy and academic writing. And I also wanna caveat this with, if you're an academic, you're an academic, and that's a lot of the value that you bring to this conversation. So it's not to be, make you pretend that you're not or to like kill your vibe more so just saying like here's some differences that you should think about as you write the comments because it is a bit of a different uh you know audience but also feel feel free to keep your flair um but first definitely assume a more general audience um I mean, obviously there's a lot of FTC experts in this field or a lot of F experts in the fields read the FTC, but in general, like your comments will be read. I don't know exactly by who. So just assume a more general audience when writing, which also includes, you know, avoiding academic wording and jargon, jargon just to more so explain, you know, what you mean. Um, so for example, like I'm really into like, you know, black, fem uh, black feminism, <laughs> et cetera. Like I might not say like, due to black feminism, you need to think about XXX. I maybe more so say like um, through this, this, this example, you can see how black women are affected by et cetera. They need to be thought about blah, blah, blah. Um, it's just explaining it instead of assuming what people mean, which uh, my, I, my boss, both of my bosses were lawyers at Greenlining and they would kind of always highlight that for me because I think it came from a more academic approach. And they're like, you just gotta explain it. And I actually found that really useful because sometimes I realized I was using words that was like, ah, you, you could actually explain this because do you really mean that or do you mean something else? Um, so, so just making sure that you explain all the terms that you're using or maybe instead of using those terms, which I'll talk about in a bit, using explanations instead to kind of substitute for them. And then also with policy writing, only state what is absolutely ne necessary to understand the issue. Um, comments can be as long as you want them to be. Like I said, they could be a sentence, they could be 10 to 15 pages. Um, but at the end of the day, most policy folks are pretty limited on time. <laughs> and so 10 pages isn't bad. I've submitted multiple 10 page comments. Like that's not a bad thing at all. Um, but just make sure that, uh, make sure that 
you're only included, you're only including what is absolutely necessary to make your case, which is actually the fun thing about policy writing it can be very direct. Like I don't have to set up the conversation a ton. I can just get into, this is the point you need to care about broadband access for these reasons. Historically folks have been discriminated, bam, bam. Like that's it. I don't, I don't need to go into theories of racism, et cetera. Um, but of course you want to also ensure that nuance isn't flattened, which is the difficult part of policy writing because you're trying to hold a lot within, like I said, even within that fact sheet, they're trying to say a lot within two pages. Um, but that's also why fact sheets and again, smaller writings can be useful is because they are having the nuance but having to say it in a very um, uh, short or, or shorter way. Um, and then I put this point on theory here because I do think, and this gets to the point of explaining it, I would refrain a bit from just saying like, um, again, just, Black feminism or critical race theory or socio-technical theory. I, I, don't, I don't know, whatever theory you're talking about. And just more explain it and, and, and talking about it through the explanation than just saying the theory. One, because it's hard for people to necessarily know what you mean by that. Um, two, I think also, unfortunately, in a political climate, like at Greenlining, we would never say we use critical race theory. Unfortunately, that's just not super welcomed. I would instead, you know, that's why we would instead say, you know, look at this map from the 1930s of historical redlining, look at what's occurring now. Um, I don't need to say this is critical race theory, critical but what I'm theory. using is a critical race theory. Um, and so, it, and we could talk about that more, but that's kind of like the nuance of policy writing. And I think also, unfortunately, just kind of the political reality that we live in. Um, but with that, focusing on harms and impacts, and again, honestly being more descriptive about the harms, really can take place of that wording and work really well. So you also don't have to sacrifice uh, the point you're making, you just have to really explain it more in a concise way. And so with that, uh, central components of comments. Um, and again, they really can be formatted however you want, but I'm just trying to give kind of a guideline for you. Um, first, an introduction, if you're submitting for an organization or just for yourself is useful. Like, I'd be like, hi, if I was submitting comments by myself, I'd maybe say, you know, my name is Serena, like, dear blah, 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 thank you for this rulemaking, et cetera. My name's Serena Dura. I'm a policy analyst at Dana Society, I also have experience in algorithmic accountability through XYZ. I am not representing those organizations today as the individual, but I am passionate about et cetera, et cetera. So a little introduction about you is useful. And again, kind of as I did there, you can say whether you're representing that organization or not. If you're the organization submitting it, then, then that's clear. But as an individual submitting comments, you can mention your organization, but say whether you're actually representing them. Um, and then with that, particularly with this call, they mentioned uh, using an executive summary. So just saying like, you know, this is the issue. These are the points. These are the points we make. This is what we highlight. You should pursue this rulemaking or not is useful. If your um, if your uh, comment isn't that long, you don't have to do that. But could you know could be useful, especially if it is really long to have that executive summary in the front. And then you could have backgrounds of of the issues, especially with this. Uh, rulemaking being about needing the FTC needing proof that unfair and deceptive practices relating to commercial surveillance and data security is happening. Here you could put, you know, this example, this example, this example shows that this is harm. And not only is there harm, but there's probably more harms we don't even know about. So we need this type of rulemaking, et cetera. I mean, in the backgrounds, you can put those type of facts. And then you can go into your further analysis, you know, if you have any more. Um, you know, for us, we we want to put the backgrounds giving that proof that they need that unfair and deceptive practices are happening so they need to pursue a rulemaking but then after that we also want to say you know and in addition to pursuing a rulemaking here are things you should think about as you pursue that rulemaking uh you know this call has a lot of different categories harms to consumers harms to children algorithmic discrimination uh notice transparency and disclosure uh, uh, consumer consent and a few others. Uh, there's uh, some specific ones that we're focusing on and you can focus on whatever you want. You could answer one single question. You could answer multiple questions relating to uh, the call. Um, but that's where we're more providing our analysis of, okay, outside of you should do this. And we could give some analysis of why you should do this. We're also gonna give some analysis of how you should do this, because a lot of the questions in the call beyond whether they should do it is how they should go about it and what issues they should focus on. So again, this is an opportunity to really 
tailor the focus to what should they focus on. Um, and then he concluded, maybe saying, you know, this is why we think you should do this, et cetera, very short. Um, and again, this can be as, as long as you want. I've seen multiple, especially from organizations, 10 page, uh, 10 page uh, submissions for comments. I probably wouldn't do too much longer than that, but you could. And for citations, they can just be links. Uh, I've looked at multiple different uh, comments and uh, especially for like website links, I've seen people just do that. So don't worry too much about like which format it is. Most of the time it is footnotes. So footnotes with links are good throughout the document. And then I wanna leave time for, I've, I've been talking longer than I thought. So I'm gonna get through this last part so y'all can ask questions, but I just wanted to highlight that you can organize by theme. And this is from the DNS and AI Now NAIR comment. Um, and this is actually kind of in our executive summary, but they, you know, we say in this argue, in this comment, we argue one, two, three, four. And as you uh, see in the second a photo down here, when we make one of our points, like from number one, you know, we put in parentheses relating to question one, topics A, H, and B, questions five and six. Uh, so they know what you're referring to, but you don't have to say question one, answer, question two, answer. And I think organizing by theme could be particularly useful for this call since there are so many questions and uh, it is kind of thematic. Like they literally, as I said earlier, divide it by theme. So I, I do think that's a good way to go. Unless, and here's continued. Uh, this was from a, a comment I made to the Department of Labor, but just another way of um, organizing by theme. And this one, I think it was a teeny bit more argumentative than, than the previous one that uh, Data and Society did. Like, I was just like, I'm against this proposed rule that it fails to do, et cetera, et cetera. And then I'd kind of do like point A and then point one and two underneath that, et cetera. So you can really go into it. And at the bottom here, I put uh, kind of our conclusion, like, you know, we oppose this rule, et cetera, which to highlight, you can be very active, active verbs, very active in your response to questions. Yes, you should do this, or no, you shouldn't do this. We oppose or accept this, et cetera. And then organizing by question. Um, this is just an example from another rulemaking that happened in California, but Basically, if they ask a question, it's like, should we do et cetera, et cetera? You could just put that question under, put no, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know, your explanation. And so if you wanted to answer a question by question, you could. And of course, there's 95 questions. You don't have to answer all questions. So you could say question 3, 35, 42, and just answer those if you want. You can just respond to those specific questions and have, have that be how you organize your comment. And then uh, lastly, filing for this ANPRM, you can file online um, at, at regulations.gov. Um, and in the call, they put exactly how they want you to submit it. It seems that with the FTC, and it seems more most federal agencies, they're not too picky about how you submit it. I feel like the California Public Utilities Commission is a little bit more specific. So you just have to look at each uh, agency's requirements, but the federal level, they don't seem too picky. But they did say to write commercial surveillance ANPR this number on the top of your comment, uh, put it in PDF form. If you're an organization and you want to put your logo on the top of it, you know, you can do that. Um, and I also would say at the bottom, sign off your name, like sincerely, Serena Oduro. <laughs> um, even with uh, organizations, people tend to do that to kind of show who exactly was writing it. Um, but yeah, and then submit in, in PDF form and you can submit online. You can also submit in paper. I don't know exactly how to do that, but they do show how online, but online's probably easier. So I would recommend online. 